Hello and welcome to another Oh So Retro video. Today we are going to be continuing the series on early PC 3D accelerator cards and looking at something that completely changed the face of PC gaming. Something that allowed the humble PC to not only compete with the latest consoles, but to blow them and every other 3D accelerator at the time for that matter into next week. So ladies and gentlemen, it's time to meet the grandfather of Glide, the big kahuna, the one and only 3DFX Voodoo. But before we do that, I have to admit to one tiny detail. I don't actually have an original Voodoo 1 graphics card. But I do have a Voodoo 2. And since I'm going to be putting it into a Pentium 1 system where the CPU will be the limiting factor anyway, I'm going to say it's good enough. Now this is a video I've been wanting to do for a long time because unlike the other early 3D accelerators I'll be looking at in future videos, I actually had a Voodoo card back in the day, so that kind of means it has a special place in my heart and in my computing history. It all began one fateful day back in 1997 when I went over to my next door neighbor's house and saw him playing Carmageddon on his new Voodoo 1. I was already a massive Carmageddon fan at that point, but I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't believe how good it looked compared to the software mode I was playing it in. It was high res, it was smooth, it ran at double the frame rate, the textures looked amazing. I was instantly hooked. Unfortunately, I had to wait until 1998 until I could get a 3DFX card of my own. But when I did, and by that time it was a Voodoo 2, I was immediately smitten. The weird CGI Voodoo chief guy on the box, the bold fastest 3D gameplay ever statement, the fact that it could do 50 billion operations and 3 million triangles per second. This was pure voodoo magic indeed. And I loved it. I couldn't get enough of GL Quake, Incoming, Ultimate Race Pro, Need for Speed 2 Special Edition. The list went on and on. They all just looked amazing and ran even better. My cute adolescent crush had developed into a full-blown love affair. But like most early love affairs, it slowly fizzled out and I eventually moved on. I got a TNT2, then a GeForce, then a Radeon, and the Voodoo 2 lay forgotten in my computer cupboard for decades. That is until today, because this is that very card from all those years ago. It has been resurrected, revived, much like that other trope from the school of Voodoo Magic, the zombie, to do what it does best. Push some pixels, or actually triangles in this case. Assuming it still works after all this time, of course. So now that my somewhat embarrassing effusiveness over an old graphics card is complete, we can take a quick look at why the 3DFX Voodoo caused myself and millions like me to develop so much affection for it. Or in other words, what made it so good. I'm not going to go into the history of 3DFX here very much because there are already many other videos on YouTube that explore this in much more detail. But to understand why the Voodoo was so much better than the other cards requires a bit of background. 3DFX was originally started by a few X Silicon Graphics Incorporated, or SGI guys, who wanted to make hardware acceleration for the PC a reality. They settled on the idea of making a PC add-in card that could do fast, real-time 3D graphics while still being cheap enough, hopefully, to appeal to the consumer market. You know, how to do 3D graphics was, you know, sort of old hat. Problem is how do you do it cheaply? And how did they achieve the seemingly impossible task? Well, they cheated, obviously. And there was no way you could build a full-fledged, you know, CAD-quality 3D graphics chip. And so what we did is we cheated. We, we made something that was uh, good enough, as Gary was talking, from the color standpoint, and, and uh, enough polygons and enough everything else to be a, a game machine. Using their knowledge of how the big, expensive SGI workstations used to create CGI for movies like Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park worked, the 3DFX engineers set about removing as much functionality and features as possible to the point where they could build a chipset that would still produce decent looking visuals and run fast, but crucially was also affordable. In terms of the algorithms, there wasn't any new things invented in terms of the implementation of how you actually do it inexpensively. I would say that's you know where the, some of the innovation came from. Yes, so we did a lot the, of things that other people who were trying to do $20 chips coming up from the bottom would not do because that's too many gates, it's too expensive. But we had a million transistors on each chip. It was more expensive, but we could do enough of the bare bones minimum that it could do like real 
you know, SGI type style graphics for Jeep. And in the end, they settled on a two chip design. We had this two chip set and one chip was what we called the frame buffer chip. And so that did the Z buffering and the gross shading. And then we had a second chip that was called uh, T-Rex for texture mapping chip. And T-Rex ultimately was kind of the real secret to our success was the fact that we could do real time, perspective correct, bilinear filter yeah. texture Six, mapping. 16 bit was, text, RGB textures and a high quality so the developers didn't have to jump through hoops. And this brings us on to the next key point that was a major factor in 3DFX's success. While other manufacturers like S3 and their Verge chipset that we looked at in the last video used their existing 2D cards and tried to add some 3D functionality to them, usually with very poor results, 3DFX decided to just throw out the whole 2D thing and start from the ground up with a board devoted entirely to 3D. At the time, this was a pretty radical idea. A graphics card with no 2D functionality was basically unheard of. So we sacrificed 2D which was, was very heretical at the time. We, we, we left it out of the chip. And you, you know, we were told by many, many experts in the field, you can't sell a graphics chip without 2D. You know, how do you run Windows? And our answer was, you don't. But in hindsight, this was actually a brilliant idea. There were already millions of 2D-only cards out there, so why should 3DFX try to reinvent the wheel and waste time and resources on developing something that others were already doing perfectly well? Also, leaving out 2D would allow the Voodoo to devote all of its power and resources to 3D, thereby increasing performance massively. The 2D guys that were trying to come up from that kind of legacy architecture and, and add 3D, we would clobber them. They didn't have enough gates, they didn't have enough memory bandwidth, and um, you know, we loved to do side-by-side -side comparisons because it was just a joke. Another major piece of the puzzle was memory. Not only had memory prices been coming down rapidly in the years prior to the Voodoo's release. I mean, something happened along the way, which was the price of memory fell through the floor. When we were first doing the business model, I think we anticipated the initial graphics boards were going to be like a thousand bucks. And by the time we had silicon, we were using EDO memory, right? Yep. It had gone from a hundred bucks a megabyte or something, or I can't recall what the numbers were, but to something like like, hey guys, we could actually have a consumer product here. But the speed at which memory could operate had also been increasing rapidly. 3DFX engineers took further advantage of this by creating more memory interleaves, or connections between the graphic card's chips and the memory than anyone else had at the time, resulting in memory bandwidths higher than anything their competitors could even dream of. Because people coming up from the PC market had a chip that had memory out there, and that was it and they just used it for doing all this stuff. And what, what was innovative about our design was because this chip wasn't doing traditional 2D graphics, we could do anything with the memory we wanted. And so Scott did a lot of innovative things. You had two different interleaves, two or three for the frame buffer controller, one for the Z buffer and one for the color, and then four way on the texture mapping. Because we set the bar a little higher, we said we want to do all these nice features, inexpensively but still fast. And that required six different memory interleaves across the two chips, where most people had one. I mean, our memory bandwidth that we had at the time was possibly an order of magnitude more yeah. than other people. Uh, and that's why we could achieve things that no one else could do. Once you put all this together, you have a card that not only looked good on paper like many of its competitors did at the time, but, unlike most of its competitors, looked even better in reality. So good, in fact, that side by side, it became very difficult to tell the difference between 3DFX's little chip and a $250,000 SGI Reality Engine workstation running the same game demo. Um, most of our side by side comparisons were actually on this $250,000 Reality Engine that we bought. And, you know, like this Valley of Raw demo, we had it running on both. <clears throat> and you would sit and stare at this thing and you could not tell the difference. It was really remarkable. Some, you know, PC graphics board that was you know, that big compared to some monster reality engine. Right, so with all that out the way, we can look at the actual card a bit more. This is a creative 3D Blaster 12 megabyte Voodoo 2, or at least that's what I thought for the last 22 years. But today I found out that that's probably not actually true. Even though I bought this card brand new in an unopened Creative Labs 3D Blaster box, like this one back in the day, and I've had the card ever since, I recently noticed that there is no CT number anywhere on the PCB. 
My initial guess was that this was an early creator Voodoo 2 and was produced before they started branding them as CT 6670s, which was the designation applied to all other creator Voodoo 2s that I've ever seen. But upon further research, I found that this card is actually made by a trend and not creative. How an A Trend card ended up in an unopened Creative Labs box back in 1998 is a total mystery to me. Anyway, now that my childhood has been shattered, let's get on with it, shall we? Like the Voodoo 1, the Voodoo 2 is a pure 3D only graphic solution, meaning it can't do any form of 2D, as mentioned earlier. And so it requires the user to have an existing 2D card to handle all the boring stuff, like Windows. The Voodoo then connects to the existing 2D card through this external pass-through cable which allows it to take over the rendering from the 2D card when a game starts and render that output directly to the monitor. Also, since this is a Voodoo 2, it has a few differences and improvements over the Voodoo 1. Firstly, there are two of these T-Rex or texture mapping chips we heard about earlier and their associated RAM, whereas the Voodoo 1 would have only had one of these. Secondly, the Voodoo 2 used an improved fabrication process and faster RAM that allowed the Voodoo 2 to run at nearly twice the speed, 90 MHz compared to the 50 MHz of a Voodoo 1. Anyway, that's enough hardware porn. Let's get this baby into the light wood grain Pentium and see what she can do. So I have the card installed and we are back in Windows ready to go. Before I get started, I just want to mention that my VGA capture on this channel is not great quality at the moment, so the gameplay footage will look nowhere near as good as it does on the actual CRT monitor. I've done my best to capture the highest quality I can with the hardware I have, and hopefully you can still see what is going on. Choosing which games to show off for this video was a bit tricky because there were so many games that supported 3 as hardware and their proprietary Glide API back in the day, but I decided to start with a game that literally put 3D effects on gamers radar, Quake. Quake was one of the very first, if not the first game to have a proper full 3D engine, unlike the 2.5D of earlier games like Doom and Duke Nukem 3D. And for the longest time, John Carmack, ID's chief programmer and 3D engine guru, had been a staunch supporter of using software rendering for his engines. But once he saw what the 3D effects Voodoo could do, he immediately realized its potential and quickly created a patch to add Voodoo support to Quake. And the result was, well, awesome, really. Once you had played GL Quake, the 3D effects version, you couldn't go back to software mode and gamers clamored to get their hands on the Voodoo card so they too could experience Quake like it was meant to be played. It looks great, it runs fast, although the color palette consists mostly of browns and greens, so it is a bit drab. Next up is Quake 2. Although nowhere near as revolutionary as Quake 1, and with a story and setting that had seemingly nothing to do with the first game in the series, Quake 2 was nonetheless a brilliant game to showcase the capabilities of the new Voodoo 2 in 1998. This was the first time I had seen coloured lighting, and it looked so cool. Coloured lighting was, and still is, awesome. Other than that though, Quake was a pretty generic first person shooter of the time, Although its story was more developed and consistent than Quake 1, so that was good. Plus, it was nowhere near as brown as Quake and actually had colors. Hooray! Now onto the game that introduced me to the Voodoo and which I probably spent more time than any other playing, Carmageddon. Carmageddon's mix of ultra-violent vehicular mayhem, dark and naughty humor and open-ish world gameplay that refused to punish the player for anything they did was pretty revolutionary for the time. We had never seen anything remotely like it. It shocked parents, it delighted adolescents, and it got itself banned all over the world for good measure. I loved it, but in the cold light of today I find myself slightly disappointed playing it on this Pentium 1 machine. The performance is really quite poor, which I'm pretty sure is down to the CPU not being fast enough. I certainly don't remember it running this badly as a kid, but maybe I had different standards back then. It's a pity because it looks pretty damn good. Need for Speed 2 Special Edition is next, and this runs really nicely in 3D effects mode as well. Although there are frame rate drops from time to time, again probably caused by the CPU being a bit slow, 
It's totally playable though and I have many fond memories of late night Need for Speed 2 LAN parties back in the day. Those were good times. Finally we have Motorhead. This is a funky little arcade driving game that I never really played much back in the day for some reason. But I found the CD amongst my old software and I'm really glad I decided to try it because it looks really good on the Voodoo. Probably one of the best showcases of what the Voodoo could actually do. If this doesn't look very impressive to you, remember that this was in 1998. Most arcade machines didn't even look this good. And this was running on a lowly Pentium PC. Pretty damn impressive I think. As for the game itself, it's okay. It's a fairly generic arcade racer, but the soundtrack's banging so that earns us some bonus points. So that's pretty much all I have for you in today's video. The 3DFX Voodoo was a pretty special card back in the day because it was a genuine technological leap which transformed the PC into a fully fledged gaming powerhouse which could easily compete with and even outclass anything from expensive arcade machines to the latest consoles. It kickstarted a technological arms race that continues to this day and which has provided us gamers with a countless number of amazing games and even more impressive hardware and visuals. It's the grandfather of the modern day GPU and it was responsible for making my teenage years significantly more fun and for that it has my appreciation and thanks. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you like this video then feel free to leave a comment or a like and don't forget to subscribe for more of this sort of content in the future. Until next time, cheers guys.